Chapter Eleven, Part One of Something New. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Something New by P. G. Woodhouse. Chapter Eleven, Part One. Landing's Castle dozed in the calm of an English Sunday afternoon. All was peace. Freddy was in bed with orders from the doctor to stay there until further notice. Baxter had washed his face. Lord Emsworth had returned to his garden fork. The rest of the house party strolled about the grounds or sat in them, for the day was one of those late spring days that are warm with a premature suggestion of midsummer. Aileen Peters was sitting at the open window of her bedroom, which commanded an extensive view of the terraces. A pile of letters lay on the table beside her, for she had just finished reading her mail. The postman came late to the castle on Sundays, and she had not been able to do this until luncheon was over. Aileen was puzzled. She was conscious of a fit of depression for which she could in no way account. She had a feeling that all was not well with the world, which was the more remarkable in that she was usually keenly susceptible to weather conditions, and reveled in sunshine like a kitten. Yet here was a day nearly as fine as an American day, and she found no solace in it. She looked down on the terrace. As she looked, the figure of George Emerson appeared, walking swiftly, and at the sight of him something seemed to tell her that she had found the key to her gloom. There are many kinds of walk. George Emerson's was the walk of mental unrest. His hands were clasped behind his back, his eyes stared straight in front of him from beneath lowering brows, and between his teeth was an unlighted cigar. No man who is not a professional politician holds an unlighted cigar in his mouth unless he wishes to irritate and baffle a ticket chopper in the subway, or because unpleasant meditations have caused him to forget he has it there. Plainly, then, all was not well with George Emerson. Aileen had suspected as much at luncheon, and looking back she realized that it was at luncheon her depression had begun. The discovery startled her a little. She had not been aware, or she had refused to admit to herself, that George's troubles bulked so large on her horizon. She had always told herself that she liked George, that George was a dear old friend, that George amused and stimulated her, but she would have denied she was so wrapped up in George that the sight of him in trouble would be enough to spoil for her the finest day she had seen since she left America. There was something not only startling but shocking in the thought, for she was honest enough with herself to recognize that Freddy, her official loved one, might have paced the grounds of the castle chewing an unlighted cigar by the hour without stirring any emotion in her at all. And she was to marry Freddy next month. This was surely a matter that called for thought. She proceeded, gazing down the while at the perambulating George, to give it thought. Aileen's was not a deep nature. She had never pretended to herself that she loved the Honorable Freddy, in the sense in which the word is used in books. She liked him, and she liked the idea of being connected with the peerage. Her father liked the idea, and she liked her father, and the combination of these likings had caused her to reply yes, when last autumn Freddy, swelling himself out like an embarrassed frog and gulping, had uttered that memorable speech beginning, I say, you know, it's like this, don't you know, and ending, what I mean is, will you marry me, what? She had looked forward to being placidly happy as the Honorable Mrs. Frederick Threepwood, and then George Emerson had reappeared in her life, a disturbing element. Until today she would have resented the suggestion that she was in love with George. She liked to be with him, partly because he was so easy to talk to, and partly because it was exciting to be continually resisting the will-power he made no secret of trying to exercise. But today there was a difference. She had suspected it at luncheon, and she realized it now. As she looked down at him from behind the curtain, and marked his air of gloom, she could no longer disguise it from herself. She felt maternal, horribly maternal. George was in trouble, and she wanted to comfort him. Freddy, too, was in trouble. But did she want to comfort Freddy? No. On the contrary, she was already regretting her promise, so lightly given before luncheon, to go and sit with him that afternoon. 
a well-marked feeling of annoyance that he should have been so silly as to tumble downstairs and sprain his ankle, was her chief sentiment respecting Freddie. George Emerson continued to perambulate, and Aileen continued to watch him. At last she could endure it no longer. She gathered up her letters, stacked them in a corner of the dressing-table, and left the room. George had reached the end of the terrace, and turned when she began to descend the stone steps outside the front door. He quickened his pace as he caught sight of her. He halted before her and surveyed her morosely. "'I have been looking for you,' he said. "'And here I am. Cheer up, George. Whatever is the matter? I have been sitting in my room looking at you, and you have been simply prowling. What has gone wrong?' "'Everything. How do you mean everything?' "'Exactly what I say. I'm done for. Read this.' Aileen took the yellow slip of paper. "'A cable,' added George. "'I got it this morning. Mailed on from my rooms in London. Read it.' "'I'm trying to. It doesn't seem to make sense.' George laughed grimly. "'It makes sense, all right.' "'I don't see how you can say that. Meredith, elephant, kangaroo?' office cipher. I was forgetting. Elephant means seriously ill and unable to attend to duty. Meredith is one of the partners in my firm in New York. Oh, I'm so sorry. Do you think he is very sick? Are you very fond of Mr. Meredith? Meredith is a good fellow, and I like him, but if it was simply a matter of his being ill, I'm afraid I could manage to bear up under the news. Unfortunately, kangaroo means return without fail by the next boat." "'You must return by the next boat?' Aileen looked at him, in her eyes a slow-growing comprehension of the situation. "'Oh,' she said at length. "'I put it stronger than that,' said George. "'But the next boat, that means on Wednesday. "'Wednesday morning from Southampton. "'I shall have to leave here to-morrow.' Aileen's eyes were fixed on the blue hills across the valley, but she did not see them. There was a mist between— she was feeling crushed and ill-treated and lonely. It was as though George was already gone, and she left alone in an alien land. "'But George,' she said. She could find no other words for her protest against the inevitable. "'It's bad luck,' said Emerson quietly. "'But I shouldn't wonder if it is not the best thing that really could have happened. It finishes me cleanly, instead of letting me drag on and make both of us miserable.' If this cable hadn't come, I suppose I should have gone on bothering you up to the day of your wedding. I should have fancied to the last moment that there was a chance for me. But this ends me with one punch. Even I haven't the nerve to imagine that I can work a miracle in the few hours before the train leaves to-morrow. I must just make the best of it. If we ever meet again, and I don't see why we should, you will be married. My particular brand of mental suggestion doesn't work at long range. I shan't hope to influence you by telepathy. He leaned on the balustrade at her side and spoke in a low, level voice. This thing, he said, coming as a shock, coming out of the blue sky without warning. Meredith is the last man in the world you would expect to crack up. He looked as fit as a dray horse the last time I saw him. Somehow seems to have hammered a certain amount of sense into me. Odd it never struck me before, but I suppose I have been about the most bumptious, conceited fool that ever happened. Why I should have imagined that there was a sort of irresistible fascination in me, which was bound to make you break off your engagement and upset the whole universe, simply to win the wonderful reward of marrying me, is more than I can understand. I suppose it takes a shock to make a fellow see exactly what he really amounts to. I couldn't think any more of you than I do, but if I could— the way you have put up with my mouthing and swaggering and posing as a sort of superman would make me do it. You have been wonderful. Aileen could not speak. She felt as though her whole world had been turned upside down in the last quarter of an hour. This was a new George Emerson, a George at whom it was impossible to laugh, but an insidiously attractive George. Her heart beat quickly. Her mind was not clear, but dimly she realized— that he had pulled down her chief barrier of defence, and that she was more open to attack than she had ever been. Obstinacy, the automatic desire to resist the pressure of a will that attempted to overcome her own, had kept her cool and level-headed in the past. With masterfulness she had been able to cope. Humility was another thing altogether. Soft-heartedness was Aileen's weakness. She had never clearly recognised it, 
but it had been partly pity that had induced her to accept Freddie. He had seemed so downtrodden and sorry for himself during those autumn days when they had first met. Prudence warned her that strange things might happen if once she allowed herself to pity George Emerson. The silence lengthened. Aileen could find nothing to say. In her present mood there was danger in speech. "'We have known each other so long,' said Emerson, "'and I have told you so often that I love you. "'We have come to make almost a joke of it, as though we were playing some game. "'It just happens that that is our way, to laugh at things. "'But I am going to say it once again, even though it has come to be a sort of catchphrase. "'I love you. "'I am reconciled to the fact that I am done for, out of the running, "'and that you are going to marry somebody else. "'But I am not going to stop loving you.' "'It isn't a question of whether I should be happier if I forgot you. "'I can't do it. "'It's just an impossibility, and that's all there is to it. "'Whatever I may be to you, you are part of me, and you always will be part of me. "'I might just as well try to go on living without breathing as living without loving you.' "'He stopped and straightened himself. "'That's all. "'I don't want to spoil a perfectly good spring afternoon for you by pulling out the tragic stop. "'I had to say all that, but it's the last time.' It shan't occur again. There will be no tragedy when I step into the train tomorrow. Is there any chance that you might come and see me off? Aileen nodded. You will? That will be splendid. Now I'll go and pack and break it to my host that I must leave him. I expect it will be news to him to learn that I am here. I doubt if he knows me by sight. Aileen stood where he had left her, leaning on the balustrade. In the fullness of time there came to her the recollection she had promised Freddie that shortly after luncheon she would sit with him. The Honourable Freddie, draped in purple pajamas and propped up with many pillows, was lying in bed reading Gridley Quayle, Investigator. Aileen's entrance occurred at a peculiarly poignant moment in the story, and gave him a feeling of having been brought violently to earth from a flight in the clouds. It is not often an author has the good fortune to grip a reader, as the author of Gridley Quayle gripped Freddy. One of the results of his absorbed mood was that he greeted Aileen with a stare of an even glassier quality than usual. His eyes were by nature a trifle prominent, and to Aileen, in the overstrung condition in which her talk with George Emerson had left her, they seemed to bulge at her like a snail's. A man seldom looks his best in bed— and to Aileen, seeing him for the first time at this disadvantage, the Honourable Freddy seemed quite repulsive. It was with a feeling of positive panic that she wondered whether he would want her to kiss him. Freddy made no such demand. He was not one of your demonstrative lovers. He contented himself with rolling over in bed and dropping his lower jaw. "'Hello, Aileen.' Aileen sat down on the edge of the bed. "'Well, Freddy?' Her betrothed improved his appearance a little by hitching up his jaw. As though feeling that would be too extreme a measure, he did not close his mouth altogether, but he diminished the abyss. The Honourable Freddy belonged to the class of persons who move through life with their mouths always restfully open. It seemed to Aileen that on this particular afternoon a strange dumbness had descended on her. She had been unable to speak to George, and now she could not think of anything to say to Freddy. She looked at him, and he looked at her, and the clock on the mantelpiece went on ticking. "'It was that bally cat of Aunt Anne's,' said Freddy, at length, essaying light conversation. "'It came legging it up the stairs, and I took the most frightful toss. I hate cats. Do you hate cats? I knew a fellow in London who couldn't stand cats.' Aileen began to wonder whether there was not something permanently wrong with her organs of speech. It should have been a simple matter to develop the cat theme— but she found herself unable to do so. Her mind was concentrated, to the exclusion of all else, on the repellent nature of the spectacle provided by her loved one in pyjamas. Freddy resumed the conversation. "'I was just reading a corking book. Have you ever read these things? They come out every month, and they're corking. The fellow who writes them must be a corker. It beats me how he thinks of these things. They are about a detective, a chap called Gridley Quayle, frightfully exciting. An obvious remedy for dumbness struck Aileen. Shall I read to you, Freddy? Right ho! Good scheme. I've got to the top of this page. Aileen took the paper-covered book. Seven guns covered him with deadly precision. 
Did you get as far as that? Yes, just beyond. It's a bit thick, don't you know? This chappy quail has been trapped in a lonely house, thinking he was going to see a pal in distress, and instead of the pal there pop out a whole squad of mask blighters with guns. I don't see how he's going to get out of it myself, but I'll bet he does. He's a corker. If anybody could have pitied Aileen more than she pitied herself, as she waded through the adventures of Mr. Quayle, it would have been Ash Marson. He had writhed as he wrote the words, and she writhed as she read them. The Honorable Freddie also writhed, but with tense excitement. "'What's the matter? Don't stop!' he cried, as Aileen's voice ceased. "'I'm getting hoarse, Freddie." Freddie hesitated. The desire to remain on the trail with Gridley struggled with rudimentary politeness. "'How would it be—would you mind if I just took a look at the rest of it myself? "'We could talk afterwards, you know. I shan't be long.' "'Of course. Do read it if you want to. "'But do you really like this sort of thing, Freddy?' "'Me? Rather. Why, don't you?' "'I don't know. It seems a little—I don't know.' Freddy had become absorbed in his story. Aileen did not attempt further analysis of her attitude toward Mr. Quayle. She relapsed into silence.' It was a silence pregnant with thought. For the first time in their relations, she was trying to visualize to herself exactly what marriage with this young man would mean. Hitherto, it struck her, she had really seen so little of Freddy that she had scarcely had a chance of examining him. In the crowded world outside, he had always seemed a tolerable enough person. Today, somehow, he was different. Everything was different today. This, she took it, was a fair sample of what she might expect after marriage. Marriage meant, to come to essentials, that two people were very often, and for lengthy periods alone together, dependent on each other for mutual entertainment. What exactly would it be like being alone often and for lengthy periods with Freddy? Well, it would, she assumed, be like this. It's all right, said Freddy, without looking up. He did get out. He had a bomb on him, and he threatened to drop it and blow the place to pieces unless the blighters let him go. So they cheesed it. I knew he had something up his sleeve. Like this. Aileen drew a deep breath. It would be like this. Forever and ever and ever. Until she died. She bent forward and stared at him. Freddy, she said, do you love me? There was no reply. Freddy... Do you love me? Am I a part of you? If you hadn't me, would it be like trying to go on living without breathing? The Honorable Freddy raised a flushed face and gazed at her with an absent eye. Eh, hey, what? he said. Do I? Oh, yes, rather, I say. One of the blighters has just loosed a rattlesnake into Gridley Quayle's bedroom through the transom. Aileen rose from her seat and left the room softly. The Honorable Freddy read on, unheeding. Ash Marson had not fallen far short of the truth in his estimate of the probable effect on Mr. Peters of the information that his precious scarab had once more been removed by alien hands, and was now farther from his grasp than ever. A drawback to success in life is that failure, when it does come, acquires an exaggerated importance. Success had made Mr. Peters, in certain aspects of his character, a spoiled child. At the moment when Ash broke the news, he would have parted with half his fortune to recover the scarab. Its recovery had become a point of honor. He saw it as the prize of a contest between his will and that of whatever malignant powers there might be ranged against him in the effort to show him that there were limits to what he could achieve. He felt as he had felt in the old days when people sneaked up on him in Wall Street and tried to loosen his grip on a railroad or a pet stock. He was suffering from that form of paranoia which makes men multimillionaires. Nobody would be foolish enough to become a multimillionaire if it were not for the desire to prove himself irresistible. Mr. Peters obtained a small relief for his feelings by doubling the existing reward, and Ash went off in search of Joan, hoping that this new stimulus, acting on their joint brains, might develop inspiration. "'Have any fresh ideas been vouchsafed to you?' he asked. "'You may look on me as baffled.' Joan shook her head. "'Don't give up,' she urged. "'Think again. Try to realize what this means, Mr. Marson. Between us, we have lost ten thousand dollars in a single night. I can't afford it. It is like losing a legacy. 
I absolutely refused to give in without an effort and go back to writing Duke and Earl stories for home gossip. The prospect of tackling Gridley Quayle again! Why, I was forgetting that you were a writer of detective stories. You ought to be able to solve this mystery in a moment. Ask yourself, what would Gridley Quayle have done? I can answer that. Gridley Quayle would have waited helplessly for some coincidence to happen to help him out. Had he no methods? He was full of methods, but they never led him anywhere without the coincidence. However, we might try to figure it out. What time did you get to the museum? One o'clock. And you found the scarab gone. What does that suggest to you? Nothing. What does it suggest to you? Absolutely nothing. Let us try again. Whoever took the scarab must have had special information that Peters was offering the reward. Then why hasn't he been to Mr. Peters and claimed it? True. That would seem to be a flaw in the reasoning. Once again, whoever took it must have been in urgent and immediate need of money. And how are we to find out who was in urgent and immediate need of money? Exactly. How indeed? There was a pause. "'I should think your Mr. Quayle must have been a great comfort to his clients, wasn't he?' said Joan. "'Inductive reasoning, I admit, seems to have fallen down to a certain extent,' said Ash. "'We must wait for the coincidence. I have a feeling that it will come.' He paused. "'I am very fortunate in the way of coincidences.' "'Are you?' Ash looked about him, and was relieved to find that they appeared to be out of earshot of their species." It was not easy to achieve this position at the castle, if you happened to be there as a domestic servant. The space provided for the ladies and gentlemen attached to the guests was limited, and it was rarely that you could enjoy a stroll without bumping into a maid, a valet, or a footman. But now they appeared to be alone. The drive leading to the back regions of the castle was empty. As far as the eye could reach, there were no signs of servants, upper or lower. Nevertheless, Ash lowered his voice. "'Was it not a strange coincidence,' he said, "'that you should have come into my life at all?' "'Not very,' said Joan, prosaically. "'It was quite likely that we should meet sooner or later, "'as we lived on different floors of the same house. "'It was a coincidence that you should have taken that room. "'Why?' "'Ash felt damped. "'Logically, no doubt, she was right. "'But surely she might have helped him out a little "'in this difficult situation.' Surely her woman's intuition should have told her that a man who has been speaking in a loud and cheerful voice does not lower it to a husky whisper without some reason. The hopelessness of his task began to weigh on him. Ever since that evening at Market Blanding's station, when he realized that he loved her, he had been trying to find an opportunity to tell her so, and every time they had met, the talk had seemed to be drawn irresistibly into practical and unsentimental channels. And now, when he was doing his best to reason it out that they were twin souls who had been brought together by a destiny it would be foolish to struggle against, when he was trying to convey the impression that fate had designed them for each other, she said, Why? It was hard. He was about to go deeper into the matter when, from the direction of the castle, he perceived the Honorable Freddy's valet, Mr. Judson, approaching that it was this repellent young man's object to break in on them and rob him of his one small chance of inducing Joan to appreciate, as he did, the mysterious workings of Providence as they affected herself and him, was obvious. There was no mistaking the valet's desire for conversation. He had the air of one brimming over with speech. His wonted indolence was cast aside, and as he drew nearer he positively ran. He was talking before he reached them. "'Miss Simpson, Mr. Marson, it's true what I said that night. It's a fact.' Ash regarded the intruder with a malevolent eye. Never fond of Mr. Judson, he looked on him now with positive loathing. It had not been easy for him to work himself up to the point where he could discuss with Joan the mysterious ways of Providence, for there was that about her which made it hard to achieve sentiment. That indefinable something in Joan Valentine, which made for nocturnal raids on other people's museums, also rendered her a somewhat difficult person to talk to about twin souls and destiny. The qualities that Ash loved in her, her strength, her capability, her valiant self-sufficingness, were the very qualities which seemed to check him when he tried to tell her that he loved them. 
Mr. Judson was still babbling. "'It's true. There ain't a doubt of it now. It's been and happened, just as I said that night.' "'What did you say? Which night?' inquired Ash. "'That night at dinner. The first night you two came here. Don't you remember me talking about Freddy and the girl he used to write letters to in London? The girl I said was so like you, Miss Simpson. What was her name again? Joan Valentine? That was it. The girl at the theatre that Freddy used to send me with letters to pretty nearly every evening. Well, she's been and done it. Same as I told you all that night she was jolly likely to go and do.' She's sticking young Freddy up for his letters, just as he ought to have known she would do if he hadn't been a young fathead. They're all alike, these girls, every one of them. Mr. Judson paused, subjected the surrounding scenery to a cautious scrutiny, and resumed. I took a suit of Freddy's clothes away to brush just now, and happening— Mr. Judson paused and gave a little cough. Happening to glance at the contents of his pockets, I come across a letter— I took a sort of look at it before setting it aside, and it was from a fellow named Jones, and it said that this girl Valentine was sticking on to young Freddy's letters what he'd written her, and would see him blowed if she parted with them under another thousand. And, as I made it out, Freddy had already given her five hundred. Where he got it is more than I can understand, but that's what the letter said. This fellow Jones said he had passed it to her with his own hands, but she wasn't satisfied, and if she didn't get the other thousand she was going to bring an action for breach. And now Freddy has given me a note to take to this Jones, who is stopping in market landings. Joan had listened to this remarkable speech with a stunned amazement. At this point she made her first comment. "'But that can't be true. Saw the letter with my own eyes, Miss Simpson. But—' She looked at Ash helplessly. Their eyes met, hers wide with perplexity, his bright with the light of comprehension. "'It shows,' said Ash slowly, "'that he was in immediate and urgent need of money.' "'You bet it does,' said Mr. Judson with relish. "'It looks to me as though young Freddy had about reached the end of his tether this time. "'My word, there won't half be a kick-up if she does sue him for breach. "'I'm off to tell Mr. Beach and the rest.' They'll jump out of their skins. His face fell. Oh, Lord, I was forgetting this note. He told me to take it at once. I'll take it for you, said Ash. I'm not doing anything. Mr. Judson's gratitude was effusive. You're a good fellow, Marson, he said. I'll do as much for you another time. I couldn't hardly bear not to tell a bit of news like this right away. I should burst or something. And Mr. Judson, with shining face, hurried off to the housekeeper's room. "'I simply can't understand it,' said Joan at length. "'My head is going round.' "'Can't understand it? Why, it's perfectly clear. This is the coincidence for which, in my capacity of gridley quail, I was waiting. I can now resume inductive reasoning. Weighing the evidence, what do we find? That young sweep Freddy is the man. He has the scarab. But it's all such a muddle. I'm not holding his letters. For Joan's purposes, you are.' Let's get this Jones element in the affair straightened out. What do you know of him? He was an enormously fat man who came to see me one night and said he had been sent to get back some letters. I told him I had destroyed them ages ago, and he went away. Well, that part of it is clear, then. He is working a simple but ingenious game on Freddy. It wouldn't succeed with everybody, I suppose. But from what I have seen and heard of him, Freddy isn't strong on intellect. He seems to have accepted the story without a murmur. What does he do? He has to raise a thousand pounds immediately, and the raising of the first five hundred has exhausted his credit. He gets the idea of stealing the scarab. But why? Why should he have thought of the scarab at all? That is what I can't understand. He couldn't have meant to give it to Mr. Peters and claim the reward. He couldn't have known that Mr. Peters was offering a reward. He couldn't have known that Lord Emsworth had not got the scarab quite properly. He couldn't have known—he couldn't have known anything. Ash's enthusiasm was a trifle damped. There's something in that. But I have it. Jones must have known about the scarab and told him. But how could he have known? Yes, there's something in that, too. How could Jones have known? He couldn't. He had gone by the time Aileen came that night. I don't quite understand which night. It was the night of the day I first met you. 
I was wondering for a moment whether he could by any chance have overheard Aileen telling me about the scarab, and the reward Mr. Peters was offering for it. Overheard? That word is like a bugle-blast to me. Nine out of ten of Gridley Quayle's triumphs were due to his having overheard something. I think we are now on the right track. I don't. How could he have overheard us? The door was closed, and he was in the street by that time. How do you know he was in the street? Did you see him out? No, but he went. He might have waited on the stairs. You remember how dark they are at number seven, and listened. Why? Ash reflected. Why? Why? What a beast of a word that is. The detective's bugbear. I thought I had it until you said, Great Scott, I'll tell you why. I see it all. I have him with the goods. His object in coming to see you about the letters was because Freddie wanted them back, owing to his approaching marriage with Miss Peters, wasn't it? Yes. You tell him you have destroyed the letters. He goes off. Am I right? Yes. Before he is out of the house, Miss Peters is giving her name at the front door. Put yourself in Joan's place. What does he think? He is suspicious. He thinks there is some game on. He skips upstairs again, waits until Miss Peters has gone into your room, then stands outside and listens. How about that? I do believe you are right. He might quite easily have done that. He did do exactly that. I know it as though I had been there. In fact, it is highly probable I was there. You say all this happened on the night we first met? I remember coming downstairs that night. I was going out to a vaudeville show, and hearing voices in your room. I remember it distinctly. In all probability, I nearly ran into Jones. It does all seem to fit in, doesn't it? It's a clear case. There isn't a flaw in it. The only question is, can I, on the evidence, go to young Freddy and choke the scarab out of him? On the whole, I think I had better take this note to Jones, as I promised Judson, and see whether I can't work something through him. Yes, that's the best plan. I'll be starting at once. Perhaps the greatest hardship in being an invalid is the fact that people come and see you and keep your spirits up. The Honorable Freddy Threepwood suffered extremely from this. His was not a gregarious nature, and it fatigued his limited brain powers to have to find conversation for his numerous visitors. All he wanted was to be left alone to read the adventures of Gridley Quayle, and when tired of doing that, to lie on his back and look at the ceiling and think of nothing. It is your dynamic person, your energetic world's worker, who chafes at being laid up with a sprained ankle. The Honorable Freddy enjoyed it. From boyhood up he had loved lying in bed, and now that fate had allowed him to do this without incurring rebuke, he objected to having his reveries broken up by officious relations. He spent his rare intervals of solitude in trying to decide in his mind which of his cousins, uncles, and aunts was, all things considered, the greatest nuisance. Sometimes he would give the palm to Colonel Horace Mant, who struck the soldierly note. I recollect in a hill campaign in the winter of the year 93 giving my ankle the deuce of a twist. Anon, the more spiritual attitude of the Bishop of Godalming seemed to annoy him more keenly. Sometimes he would head the list with the name of his cousin Percy, Lord Stockheath, who refused to talk of anything except his late breach of promise case, and the effect the verdict had had on his old governor. Freddy was in no mood just now to be sympathetic with others on their breach of promise cases. As he lay in bed reading on Monday morning, the only flaw in his enjoyment of this unaccustomed solitude was the thought that presently the door was bound to open, and some kind inquirer insinuate himself into the room. His apprehensions proved well-founded. Scarcely had he got well into the details of an ingenious plot on the part of a secret society to eliminate Gridley Quayle by bribing his cook, a bad lot, to sprinkle chopped-up horsehair in his chicken fricassee, when the doorknob turned and Ash Marson came in. End of chapter 11, part 1